This one's called A Hard Rain on First Avenue After Midnight. A broke down old drunk man stumbled down First Avenue in the rain, trying hard not to slide away, held up mostly by his cane. With his good arm, he's supporting a girl with a swelled up foot that hurts. Slow steps moving forward and jerking and staggering back in spurts. She's hanging on tight, teeth clenched, fighting to hold back screams of pain. She hoists her broke umbrella, struggling for cover from the rain. Two poor lost souls, knowing they can't do it on their own, stumbling down First Avenue, trying hard to find a way back home. Just a broke down old drunk man and a pretty young thing in pain, wandering through purgatory in this godforsaken rain. This piece is called Dive Bars. Uh, you don't have to clap, Philip. Yeah, you know, I spent the best years of my life in dive bars. There's still a few good ones left around here in the East Village. When I moved here in 1967, I was amazed to find that there was an actual franchise chain of dive bars. They were called Blarney Stones. And they were as common as Starbucks are now. They were everywhere. They catered to blue collar workers, alcoholic housewives, sailors, construction workers, bike messengers, hookers, pimps, old drunks, white collar executives who didn't want co-workers to see them banging down six martinis for lunch, and out of work actors like me. There's actually one remaining bar, bar Warney Stone in New York City. It's right across from Penn Station on 8th Avenue. And I spent a lot of hours in that one back in 61 and 62 passing through the city when I was in the service. They had steam tables with mashed potatoes, string beans, and corned beef, and roast beef, and roast pork. It was the best in the city. You could always get away with the excuse that you were stopping by Blarney Stone to get a corned beef sandwich, and then get smashed in the middle of the afternoon. Because what really brought the hardcore afternoon drunks to Blarney Stone was cheap booze. 25 cents a shot with a Coke chaser. 35 cents with a short beer chaser. Every hour was happy hour over at Blarney Stone. Yeah, I like to think I'm more sophisticated now. I enjoy the taste of single malt scotch, California wine, French brandy, aged bourbon occasionally, mostly when somebody else is buying, like Janet did this evening. But I gotta tell you, I still have nostalgia for old Philadelphia, Corby's, Shenley's, Three Feathers, cheap shit that bites the back of your throat, lets your stomach know something bad's coming down. <laughs> Whenever I look back on good times and when I think of good friends, all my best memories seem imprinted with the smell and the taste and the bite of bottom shelf whiskey and dive bar. Makes me feel warm inside. I wish I were young again and I had the stomach for cheap booze. Unless somebody wants to buy me a round of good stuff after this. We'll see how that works out. <laughs> this piece is called Are You Dangerous? She registers with an online dating site, fills out a form, and posts a picture. Within minutes, she gets a text response from some guy who says he likes her nose. She doesn't respond. Moments later, he texts again and he says, are you dangerous? Again, she doesn't respond. A few minutes pass and he sends her a dick pic. A real romantic we got here, huh? In what universe is that supposed to like turn some girl on? He has no idea who the hell he's dealing with here. So let's go back again for a minute to the are you dangerous question. It's Sunday afternoon. She's sitting alone at the far end of a bar on 6th Street, just up the block here. It used to be called, <laughs> I won't tell you the name because it's a Coke bar. She's chatting up my buddy, the bartender, and I come in and I take a seat at the opposite end. The joint's empty except for two of us. I'm sitting there for like five minutes watching her bat her eyes at my buddy. He seems oblivious to my presence. I clear my throat a couple times, fake a loud cough. Finally, I extract him from her talons and he strolls over and he mixes up my usual. We pick up exactly where we left off last Sunday, the usual bar fly bullshit conversation. She's eavesdropping. And she later tells me she knew immediately that A, I'm someone who wouldn't notice her or remember her, and B, I'm someone whose skin she definitely wants to get under. Part A, not true. I don't make a habit of starting conversations with strangers drinking alone in an empty bar on Sunday afternoon. I figure they might be looking for a little space maybe. But what the fuck? Let the games begin. She opens with Bukowski. Do I like him? Becomes very apparent very quickly that whatever I reply will be immediately rebutted with a deliberately opposite opinion. Devil's advocate? I'm thinking more like happy hour ball buster here. So part B, true. Someone's getting under my skin. She is pissing me off. Mission accomplished, lady. I respond in kind. And you know how you kind of get dog shit stuck on your shoe and you can't seem to shake it off? 
call it fate, destiny, I don't know. I keep running into where all the favorite joints I hang out in. She's on me like a pit bull that won't let go. She verbally challenges me on everything I say. But what began as a confrontational duel of wits, slowly and imperceptibly, grows into fascination, interest, respect, and finally, a challenging and, and enduring friendship, flavored with happy hour whiskey, of course, and a lot of stimulating conversation. So back to the point, is she dangerous? Mm, I'm thinking on this watching, as she inhales long and slow in that American spirit menthol, her idle hand top selfly on the bar, a dirge of broken hearts, false starts, and roads going nowhere. So if dangerous means tangling with some sexy smart lady who can go shot for shot for you while fucking with your head and you're still liking it, then yeah, she's dangerous. Very fucking dangerous. And I like her nose too. <laughs> this is called Cheap Shots. Most days I feel like I'm dream walking through a life that's a graveyard. Ghost voices from all the bars I've ever hung out in, they keep calling out to me to come home. I know it's my real home. It's really the only place I've ever belonged. I feel like I'm destined to spend eternity in a broken down bus station bar in some shithole city, drinking bottom shelf rot gut, feeling lonely and sad, and wishing for the life I already have. This is called a toast to Johnny E. <laughs> Anybody remember Johnny E? I didn't think so. You could always find Johnny E. in the last seat at the end of the bar for happy hour at the International over in 1st Avenue near 7th Street. You guys probably know the joint. Yeah. Three Fingers Bushville, neat, with a carefully arranged and shellacked comb over, wearing that classic powder blue polyester sport coat he got 45 years ago oh, back yeah. in 72 on his way home from Vietnam. Wow. Hey, Johnny E., how you doing? Now, where you been, man? Uh, fucking ambulance took me to emergency at Bellevue instead of the VA hospital. Eight weeks I'm there with pneumonia and they tell me I got a bad liver. Goddamn landlord rents out my apartment to a woman with a kid. Of course he hasn't heard from me. He thinks I'm dead. 35 years of my life he throws in a fucking dumpster. Then my car's missing. I go down to the tow pound. They auction off my car for 75 bucks. They said I owed $2,300 in tow charges, fines, and storage fees. I got 468 bucks in my savings account. I'm running out of fucking options here, you know? He spends happy hours at the International for a few more weeks till the stash runs out. Just trying to stay warm, keep a little buzz going. The weather gets colder, panhandling him ain't working for him either. I run into him again and he's sleeping on a heat vent by the Chase Bank on 2nd Avenue. I spot him at 20. Hey, Johnny E, what's going on, man? Rejoice, rejoice, we got no choice, right? Maybe I need to try the VA again, huh? I was a door gunner on a Yui back in Nam, you know. Company A, 1st Battalion, 35th Infantry. I lit up a lot of VC with that big 50, man. No retreat, no surrender. Fucking A, brother. They owe us something, right? I don't see Johnny anymore that winter on the street or at the International. Late one night, I'm over at the Black and White on 10th Street, shooting a shit with Harry the Hat. Out of nowhere, he says, Hey, you remember Johnny E? Frankie the cop told me they found him dead in a room over at the St. Mark's Hotel back in March. Yeah, he was face down on a Swanson TV dinner. Mac and cheese, I think it was. Still wearing that fucking polyester sport coat. You know, it was sad. Frankie said nobody claimed his body. Can you believe that shit? Hey, Billy, three fingers Bushmill, neat, but Johnny E. No retreat, no surrender. Fucking anybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Losers Club. I joined the Losers Club in the summer of 1954. Until then, I'm this beautiful, relatively innocent young kid, an altar boy, honor student, teacher's pet, and I'm working on a scholarship to St. Joe's Prep. But hormones have a way of kicking in and fucking with you just when things are getting good. My dick is hard all the time. I break out in a fury of technicolor acne. My face suddenly looks like a pepperoni pizza with small volcanoes and melting cheese leaking out. Yeah, it's fucking disgusting, even to me. Wet dreams, constant sexual fantasies, and frequent masturbation are my only outlet until I discover alcohol and dancing. <laughs> Fueled by Seagram 7, I gained a reputation as a great fast dancer, what we used to call jitterbugging back then. I'd win every dance contest I ever entered. 
I can't get a date to save my life, though. I have no idea how to talk to women. All the lines my friends are using work great for them, but they come off sounding fake when I try to use them. I'm feeling like an alien. I stare longingly at those couples dancing the slow doo-wop love songs, and my heart's aching. The Shirelles, Leanders and the Hearts, the Platters, the Skyliners, the Melatones, the Clefttones. Makes me want to cry, but that's not an option for a punk-ass guinea kid in South Philly in the 50s. You just don't do that shit. I'm always sad and I'm always lonely. I want somebody to love me like in those doo-wop songs. Just ain't happening. I'm 14 years old. What the fuck? This sucks. All I really want to do is just fit in. I can't seem to figure out how everybody else does it. I watch the school in crowd. Jocks, yearbook staff, prom kings and queens, chicks with letter sweaters, and cool pimple-free guys who seem to attract women like magnets. My sadness keeps simmering until it finally boils up as anger. And I think now that something maybe I could deal with. I see the movie The Wild One with Marlon Brando, and I identify immediately with those bandit biker guys. A second-hand store provides me with a motorcycle jacket and boots that almost fit. I slick my hair back with Vaseline petroleum jelly, because I can't afford the real stuff, and it melts in hot weather and it runs down my face and my neck. Oh. So, trying to look dangerous ain't working for me too well either. But I do succeed in getting kicked out of Catholic school. I'm eventually forced to accept that I'm part of that group of pimple-faced rejects, gimps, greasers, tomboys, chubbies, nerds, geeks, flat-chested chicks, kids who read too much, sissies, and boys who suck at sports. I'm a fucking loser. <laughs> but, in the long run, turns out to be not such a bad thing. I nurse my wounds with whiskey and books for a while, and that eventually leads to writing. Totally immersed in books, I discover that feeling weird, excluded, and rejected has produced a lot of really good writers, so hey, maybe I got a shot. I submerge myself in Kerouac and those other beat writers, and I leave home at 18 to join the great pil beat pilgrimage on the road, searching for a self-discovery and the meaning of life. Turns out to be a hell of a long ride on a damn bumpy road. Ten years later, 1969, I'm on the hippie trail to the promised land, the East Village in New York City. Yeah. I'm home. Looking back at it all, it had to happen just that way. For me to become what I was meant to be all along, a downtown writer performer. We're mostly Losers Club alumni down here. I fit in just fine. Tour buses take those old frat boys and cheerleaders down here to gawk at us. And we stare back, thankful we never became the dull-eyed, bloated, middle-class suburban robots they turned into. Their peacock lives peaked at 18, and they now resemble fat, waddling pigeons. Our fledgling days might have taken a lot more time, but we came back as swans. Yeah. And that's the ultimate revenge of the nerds. Yeah. Thank you.